Welcome back to the Beltline Church of Christ. Grateful to see you back. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis the 8th chapter as we bring to a conclusion our short series of lessons uh, about the man born to bring relief. And that is uh, our, uh, our, one of our patriarchs of the faith, and that is Noah. I want to begin by reading uh, Genesis chapter 8 verse 1. Genesis 8, verse 1. It's always been an interesting little section of Scripture that we find here as we look at Genesis. It says simply this, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and of all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And there's that phrase there that I've always found a little bit interesting. God remembered Noah. What, what in the world does that mean? What, 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 is, what does the Scripture mean uh, when it says that God remembered Noah, did it mean that he forgot him? That he was just kind of floating around on the earth <laughs> all by himself? And, and God said, whoa, there's Noah. I better do something about this. Is that, obviously, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, he didn't forget him. Uh, he, he, none of that is what uh, we say or what the scripture means when it says God remembered Noah. So what does it mean? Well, when God remembered Noah, it means that he expressed his concern for him. Or better yet, it means he visited him with gracious love. So God remembers Noah. He visits him uh, with this gracious love. He moves to act on the promise that he made to Noah. And it's this thought of God remembering that we read several times throughout the Scripture. Let me tear, share with you just two other examples, because this is a theme that's pretty consistent from cover to cover, of God remembering His covenant relationship and His promises that He made to His people. In Genesis chapter 30, and verse 22, we have the uh, account of God remembering Rachel. Rachel, as you know, was barren, unable to have children. Uh, but God remembered Rachel, and she was able to conceive and bore a son to whom she named Joseph. And so this concept of God remembering, it doesn't mean he forgets. Don't get that thought to, the way we would use the word remember out of your mind and look at it from the standpoint of God remembering his covenants, it, working to move that covenant to fruition. And, and maybe the most famous remembered statement that we find is from the thief on the cross as Jesus uh, is there. The thief asks Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And so when God remembers people, it's not merely to recall to mind, but to respond to them with favor. And that's what God does here to Noah in Genesis chapter 8. He responds to him with favor. And Genesis chapter 8 verse 1 is really the turning point in this story that we've been reading about for the last several weeks. Things have been getting progressively worse. The world is getting progressively worse. The flood is getting progressively worse. But God remembers Noah, and things begin to get better. I, I want you to notice something here that I think is very important. Because in a very real sense, Genesis chapter 8 and what follows right after it, it, it marks a new beginning for the human race. I want you to notice Genesis 8.13 with me very quickly. Listen to what it says. In the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried off from the earth. This is a new year. It's a new beginning. And, and I, I guess in my, in my times that I've read through this story and I've looked at this story, I've missed that. It was, the first, it was New Year's Day, if you will, when all of this begins to take place. And so it, it's, it's marking a new life, a new beginning. And as we lead a little, read a little bit further, and I'm going to put some things on the screen for you, I want you to notice how what we read in Genesis 8 parallels back to what happened in Genesis chapter 1 when God creates the world. And what you're going to see is some of the exact same language used to talk about what's going on with Noah and his family here in Genesis chapter 8 is the exact same language that God used with Adam and Eve and, and all of creation in Genesis chapter 1. It's a pretty neat way of looking at things. And so in Genesis chapter 8 verse 1, what we see is that God sends a wind over the earth. Well, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, the Spirit of God is hovering on the water. And you want to know what the word for wind is? The same word for spirit that we read about in Genesis chapter 1. So you have this wind running over the new creation, drying things out. And you have the wind of God, the Spirit of God moving before creation happens in the book of Genesis chapter 1. 
And in Genesis chapter 8, verse 2, we see the springs of the deep and the floodgates of heaven were closed. And that parallels with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 7, where God separates the waters under heaven and they're gathered together into one place and the dry ground appears. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 5, the waters continue to recede and the tops of the mountains become visible. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 9, the water under the skies are gathered together and the dry ground appears again. And so we see that same thing happening there. Genesis chapter 8, verse 6, Noah sends out a raven and it keeps flying back and forth because it has no place to land. Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, we have the creation and God says, let the birds fly above the earth. Same imagery that we get in Genesis 8 as we get in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 8, 17, Noah is told to bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move on the ground. Genesis chapter 1, verse 25, God makes the animals, wild animals, the livestock, and all the creatures that move along the ground. And so you see this correlation continue to happen between Genesis 8 and Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis chapter 9, as we move a little bit deeper into this story of Noah, God blesses Noah and his sons, and what's he say to them? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, which is the exact same thing that God says to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 2, it says, The fear and dread of, your, of you will fall upon the beasts of the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 8, Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We could go on, but I'm hoping that you're seeing the correlation here that, that I've missed as I've studied this in times past. And so make no doubt about it. <clears throat> the story of what took place as the flood waters began to recede is the account of a new creation that parallels the account of the original creation in Genesis chapter 1. So let's look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. I want you to see the first thing that happens after Noah and his family leave the ark. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. We'll read through 22. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. That's a major sacrifice. Remember that he took 14 of every clean animal, 14 of every clean bird, and so now we're down to 13 <laughs> because one of those animals is being sacrificed on the altar to God. He continues in verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For this intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So the first recorded act of righteous Noah, after he leaves the ark with his family, we see him building an altar, and we see him offering sacrifices on it. And Noah's offerings are pleasing to the Lord. And that, that causes me to want to stop right here for just a second and say something very important that I think it's a great lesson that we learn from Noah. <clears throat> and it's this. The motivation of the worshiper is always more important than the method. Uh, that, that has always been the case from beginning to end. Motivation more important than method. To obey is better than to sacrifice, he says over and over throughout 1 Samuel. And if you think back to Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, it wasn't what was offered, but how it was offered that made the difference. And Jesus says the same thing in the New Testament. He condemns the prayers of the hypocrites, but the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective, according to James chapter 5 and verse 16. And I love the word picture that we're given here in Genesis chapter 8. It's a picture of God smelling and taking delight in the aroma of the offering. And in the same way, God takes delight in his children as we worship him in spirit and in truth. And if you look to Revelation, there's the prayers of the saints that kind of go up to him as incense. And so this image is throughout Scripture of God hearing and delighting in his people as they worship him and as they give him what he's certainly worth giving. And so the new promises given by Noah's offering and symbolized by the Lord's response 
is that God will never again curse the ground or destroy all the living creatures because of human beings like us. He had sent the great flood because of the evil inclinations of the thoughts of men's hearts. But here he promises, because of what Noah has done here, I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do that ever again. And so in an unforgettable way, God has taught his people a very important lesson. And the lesson is this, sin brings judgment. Make no doubt about it, sin brings judgment. But God also knows something. He knows that there will be no useful purpose. No useful purpose would be served by a divine decision to destroy mankind every few generations. He knows that's going to amount to nothing. And so he says, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I think it's important to point one more thing out here. I I want to point out that God does not act to destroy humankind because he is angry. What is the emotion uh, that causes God to destroy the world in the first place? Well, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says this. Listen, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was on only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And so the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animal and creeping things and birds of the heaven, for I'm sorry that I made them. So what was it? It wasn't anger. You have this picture, so many picture people have this picture of God as an angry God, one ready to pounce, ready to, ready to do. If we make one mistake, oh, he's going to give us a right cross and knock us out forever. That's, that's not the picture of God. That's not even the Old Testament picture of God. There are some people out there that believe that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New. That's crazy talk. That's not it at all. He's the same in the old as he is in the new. He didn't become a Christian overnight and and, and become something different. No, he's a gracious God. And it was his grief over the sin of mankind that caused him to say, I I just, I can't do this anymore. And he, he, he acts because of the sins of the world. And what we read here in Genesis chapter 8 and verses 20 through 22 is that God promises that the normal cycles and processes of nature are going to continue unhindered as long as the earth endures. And so the functions of time, the functions of seasons, mandated by God from the very beginning, would not be erupted, interrupted again until the end of history. Let's pause here and learn another lesson from Noah. God is faithful to his promises. Man, I think that's, I I can't say that enough. Every opportunity I get to tell you that God is faithful to his promises, I want to tell you that. You see, punishment is never the final word from God. He's faithful. He remembers Noah. He marks his faithfulness to his promises through the placement of something in the sky. What does he put in the sky? We know it's a rainbow, right? And I want you to know, though, that the rainbow is nothing less than a symbol of the military bow of the Lord. That's what it is. It's God's bow that he hangs up in the sky. God has waged war against his creation. But now, because of Noah's faithfulness, he hangs up that bow in the sky to remind all humankind that he will never wage war against humankind again. And so think back to what we said earlier about creation and, 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 uh, and original creation and this secondary creation, if you will, this new beginning that's given. Creation of the world ends on the seventh day with God doing what? God rests, right? Not because he's tired, but because he's finished. So God rests over his creation as sovereign Lord. And so the flood concludes with God resting, hanging up his bow, and saying, I'm done from fighting against the world. Pretty powerful image that we have there. Creation has begun again with Noah and his family. And in a world given to vengeance and destructive behavior, Noah lived in a right relationship with God. And the rightness of his relationship manifests itself in his obedience, as we looked at last week and we talked all about. Noah responds faithfully to his creator. However, righteousness does not imply perfection because no sooner do we read of Noah's sacrifice of praise that we read of Noah experiencing the debilitating effects 
of fermented grapes. Noah, drunk from wine, lays naked in his tent. And his condition makes him oblivious to the shame that Adam and Eve experienced when they realized the full implication of their nakedness. Noah has gone from sacrifice to sin. Take a look, Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Genesis 9, 20. Noah began to be a man of the soil. He planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backwards, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done, he said to him, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant, and may God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servants. And after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. I want to pause here and say something about Noah's drunkenness. You know, the wise man is correct. In Proverbs chapter 20, it says, Mine, Wine is a mocker, and strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Let me just say a little bit about this. Drunkenness induces people to lower their defenses. That's what it does. It lowers people's defenses, and so because of that lowered defense, they can readily succumb to some horrible sins that they wouldn't have given into if they were sober. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to encourage you to avoid it at all costs. Seriously, I can't think of anything good that comes, I can't, that comes from alcohol. There's, there's just nothing good that comes. It damages our witness to a watching world. It causes us to do some really dumb things when we lose our self-control. And I've had people in my own family who have drunk themselves to death, and it's destructive and it's horrible to watch that go on. Nothing good comes from it. And so I want to encourage you to avoid it. I could go on and on and on with that. I'm not going to, but I hope that you get the point. And you might wonder as we read through Genesis chapter 9, what's the big deal? Yeah, Noah was drunk and he shouldn't have done that, but what's all of this about the nakedness? Why is that so, so bad? Why is what Ham did so sinful? Why is it so bad? And so Noah was naked in his tent. What's the big deal? Have you ever thought that about this? Now, there's some people that want to go to extremes and say that Ham had some kind of homosexual relationship with his father. That didn't take place. That's not what's going on here uh, at all. What's going on here is Ham's lack of respect for his father. He goes in, he sees the condition of his father, but rather than cover his shame, he announces his shame. He says to his brothers, hey, come check out dad. And he guarantee if he said it to his brothers, he said it to his wife. I don't know if they had kids by this point, but he's saying it to anybody who will listen. That's how Noah knows when he wakes up that something's not quite right. Not only is he covered from his nakedness, but the rumors of what Ham has done are spreading throughout the camp where they live. This is a lack of respect that, no, that, uh, that Ham shows. And maybe, I don't know, I'm guessing here, maybe it's because Ham was the most brash and immature of his sons. We don't know what Ham said to his brothers, but we are left with the impression that it involved mocking of some sort. And Shem and Japheth, being older and perhaps more mature, were determined not to bring further disgrace on their father. And so they cover his nakedness with a garment and did not look at him. And Ham's lack of respect for his father is going to have far-reaching consequences throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Let me remind you that sin will always take you further than you want to go. It'll keep, there, keep you there longer than you want to be there, and it will cost you more than you think every single time. And maybe it's just my mind working overtime, but I've thought a lot about this incident here, and I kept coming, keep coming back to this garment that Shem and Japheth used to cover their father's sin and naked, nakedness. I keep coming, I can't get this thought out of my head. And again, maybe, maybe I'm reading too much into it, and maybe this is a stretch. But did you know Shem is the son of Noah, and it's from the line of Shem that Jesus will come. 
And just like Shem covers his father's sin, his descendant Jesus, one of his heirs, will completely and totally cover our sins once and for all by dying for us on the cross. And I want you to think about something else. I cannot say for sure that this would have happened. This is my speculation and that's all. But what happened to the only other person who was said to have walked with God in Scripture? Remember no, uh, Enoch in Genesis chapter 5? Go back to verse 21 with me. Let's read about Enoch. He's the only other person that is said to walk with God in the same manner that Noah did. Genesis 5, 21, when Enoch lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. After he fathered Methuselah 300 years uh, and had other sons and daughters, thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch doesn't go through death the way the rest of mankind had done. And I can't help but think, I can't help but wonder, if Noah doesn't have this momentary lack in judgment, if he doesn't sin in this way by getting drunk in his tent, I can't help but wonder if God would have done the same thing with him. He walked with God, and God would have just took him away. Again, speculation. I, I don't know if that would have happened, but I do know that it didn't happen. Instead, what we read in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 29 is this. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. And that's the end of our record of Noah. How sad. What a, what, what, a, what a terrible way to end the story of such an incredible man. And so I want to close with one final lesson that I think we learn from the man who was born to bring relief, and it's this. Even mighty men of faith can fall. Even mighty men of faith can fall. It is sad to me that this sinful event is the last thing we hear about Noah. The story is now going to shift to Noah's descendants and then quickly to Abram. But it does teach us an important lesson. Again, even godly men, men who walk with God, even they can fall. Getting off the ark, sacrificing to God, seeing the new world open before him must have been a literal and figurative mountaintop experience for Noah and his family. But I want to say, as I've said to you before, real life isn't lived on the mountaintop. The mountaintop is a great place to spend time, but real life is lived somewhere between the mountaintop and the valley. And life can be very difficult in that place. It can be very hard to stay faithful in that place. And Noah's response, though, I want you to get this. I think this is important to say. Noah's response to the sinful activity of his son Ham shows me something. It shows me that Noah in no way, shape, form, or fashion has abandoned God. It shows me that he still trusts God is working and will be faithful to the covenant that he has made with Noah. And I have no doubt that the 350 years that Noah lived were lived in obedience to God just like he had lived the first 600 years. But even mighty men can fall. In fact, the bottom line is this. All of us are going to fall. The real question is what are we going to do after that? Noah could have looked the other way at what Ham had done because, after all, sin had got him into that position in the first place. But he doesn't do that. Noah holds his son responsible for his own sin, for his lack of respect. And let me just be honest and say there's not a lot of parents who are going to do that. Most parents will deny, they will play games, they will excuse the activity of their children, but this man of faith who walked with God would not do that. He gets up from his fall, and he immediately turns back to God, and he trusts in God to deal out the consequences to his son. And I think that shows us the real heart and character of Noah. And even though we don't read about it here, I have no doubt that Noah also addressed his own sin with God. Because that is what people who walk with God do. They take care of their own sin problems. And so I leave you with this question. Do you walk with God. I hope that if you don't, you will begin to walk with God because nothing else matters than walking with God. Nothing. Nothing else matters than that.
if you're here tonight and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not walking with God, start a new direction right now. You know what I know what repentance is? Repentance is an about face. I'm going in the wrong direction. I repent and I go 180 direct degrees in the opposite direction. Maybe that's what you need to do tonight. You need to repent of the things that are going on in your life, your own sin. Well, get rid of it. Take care of it. Don't spend another second wrapped up in that stuff because it'll take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you there longer than you want to be there. And ultimately, it will always cost you more than you think. So get rid of it. Get rid of it and walk with God. And if you've never begun your walk with God, let tonight be the day that salvation comes into your house. And I pray that if we can help you, you'll come right now while we stand and we sing.